today we're talking about uh, Benjamin Franklin versus the Beast of the Jevedon and his abomination creation, Benjamin Franklin Stein. We're taking a slightly different track on today's episode. <laughs> um, this is now turned into a speculative fiction podcast where we um, write a series of a historical uh, movie scripts. Just sort, of, we're just it's it's sort of the elevator pitch um, for ridiculous ideas uh, podcast now. So we have Leonardo da Vinci Vampire Hunter, and we have Benjamin Franklin versus the Beast of the Devadon. Yes, in which Benjamin Franklin creates his greatest and most controversial invention using electricity, of course, uh, Benjamin Franklin Stein. And thus we usher in the, uh, I don't know what we'd call our cinematic universe. Imagine the scene, he gets the idea, how can I defeat the beast of the Jevedon? He gets the idea, of course, while he's in the bathtub with several uh, French women. Right, <laughs> of course. And one of them happens to be, oh, that's too much if one of them happens to be Mary Shelley. <laughs> well, she wasn't French, so. Right, okay. And she's like, I have an idea. Yeah. Yep. Use your electricity powers. <laughs> see, I, well, see, I'm imagining more. It's like, it's like, you know, he's in the bathtub with several French women and, you know, he's looking ponderous and they're just like, <laughs> but Monsieur Franklin, <laughs> no, come Benjamin back to Franklin. the tub. Yeah. It's like, no, and also, I've got yeah, it. Yes. Yeah. And that, that will definitely usher in our sequel, uh, Benjamin Franklin's Hot Tub Time Machine. Yep. Yes. Man. Oh, H.G. Wells's hot tub time machine. That, yeah. We want to. Anyway. Well, would you. Uh, there's a lot of stories about Ben Franklin. Would you describe him as a possibly a trickster figure? Uh, Benjamin Franklin is embodies one of the great um, aspects of the tri trickster archetype, I think. And that is being a uh, person at the crossroads or a border crosser. Mm. One of my favorite uh, authors, uh, biographers, um, Walter Isaacson. I love his Leonardo da Vinci biography. But he's done a, he's done a sort of series of people who are like that, um, who stand at the crossroads of science and art. And I do think that uh, Franklin was definitely embodied both being at the crossroads of science and art and also some trickster aspects. One thing he was famous for was um, he had all these tricks that he would play. And one of them was uh, he would still the waves. So he would go to the edge of, um, say, a lake or a, or a pond or something where the water is kind of lapping up at the surface. And he would touch his cane to the water and the, wa the waves would stop. The, the water would still. And that was his that was his magic trick. And the, the trick of it was that he had a little um, lever. He had a little button in the top of his cane and the, the center of the cane was full of oil. Which would then flow out into the water and with the with the oil rising to the surface of the water, it would stop the water from moving. It would sit on top of the water and and stop it. And he would just he had a like sort of an array of tricks like this that he would use. I think just in every I think he just wanted to be a wizard. I have never heard that Kane story before. Yeah, he's fascinating. And he like I love that's why I, I, I do worry about all these these portrayals of Benjamin Franklin, because like because uh, I, I liked the John Adams uh, series parts of it. But like he wasn't he was a like Franklin needs to be played with a twinkle in his eye. He needs to be played with. He, he was of a different sort of generation than the other founding fathers i've always felt like he was definitely more impish yeah he was very impish he was such a weirdo his um oh what was the name he wrote even early on when he was writing Con constance do good i think was his pen name for a while but he, he he wrote a series of articles um as if he was this character of, a, of an incredibly kind of fussy lady mm -hmm. um <laughs> Which is another, which is another trickster aspect. It is also the, the mutability. Um, tricksters are boundary crossers, but they're ambiguous in a lot of ways, and they they they're ambiguous. They're like masters of disguise. They take on different identities. Right. But even the Constance do good thing is is a trickster element. We have um, they're ambiguous a lot of times in terms of gender. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm 
Um, one thing I know we're going to talk about an array of tricksters, but one thing I didn't want to miss this week was um, uh, the story. One of the stories of Loki. Would that were you going to tell any Loki stories? Um, I have no Loki stories today, um, and neither before- do. I okay. There is so one before, that I don't want to hold miss. that thought. So I think sure. before you tell that story, if we haven't already, <laughs> if people haven't already figured it out, if we uh, haven't already let the fox out of the bag, <laughs> uh, that's right. Today's episode of the Monster Market is about Benjamin Franklin. Uh, exactly. No, it's we're talking tricksters. Tricksters. We're talking about tricksters today, a, and it's a, a weird topic, right? Um. Explain. Well, I just I like trickster. Like when you uh, when we say construct or when we say you know like bird centric creatures, we're, we're we're talking about creatures. But trickster is, is sort of a broad folkloric category. Like like when you say a bird creatures, there's a certain kind of creature that falls into your mind. And when you say tricksters, again, just like the tricksters, they can take all these different shapes and forms. Right. Uh, yeah, I think this is our first episode where rather than talking about, say, a, uh, for lack of a better term, rather than talking about a species, we're talking about a personality. And so each of our creatures today is not a type of creature. Each of our creatures is, um, an, an, I mean, I think for the most part, an individual Right. Like yeah, we'll be talking yeah. about an individual uh, identity, an individual personality that embodies the idea of the trickster, which is a ubiquitous idea. Again, it's, you know, we always talk about this idea of the trickster is global. It's cross culture. It's yeah, um, it is. It is a human archetype that appears everywhere. And so it must be very, very deep seated in our uh, in the shared human psyche. So yeah. what are what are some of the aspects of the trickster then? Well, I think you talked about some of them. One of which being um, there's there's a mutability yeah. with all of them, whether it's disguising oneself or changing one's form. To me, my if I had to define what a trickster character is. Um, it's a character that uses his brain over his brawn. For sure. Um, they are almost always universally characters who are not the most physically capable in their right. in their respective worlds. So they have to rely on their guile and their brain. To, and what I, yeah. what I love about that particular aspect is that use of um, that use of wit. It's kind of when i mean a lot of animals are very clever um uh but but one one thing that that we think about and when we think about ourselves as humans is this like use of our cleverness uh to make our way in the world right um and the that wit or cleverness as as being a double-edged sword is a lot of i think comes up a lot in trickster stories where 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 the 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 cleverness or the the smarts get the trickster both into trouble and out of trouble oh yeah yeah almost always it's uh, almost always the the uh predicament that the character finds themselves in is of their own making (laughs) right and i think that's why like i think that's one of the reasons we love them so much is like tricksters are us like that's so relatable yeah and if you want to go back to ancient ancient times i mean that's how humans had to survive you know we can't go toe to toe with a saber tooth tiger or a pack of hyenas or, um, you know, a human can't take down a mammoth or an elephant with his, you know, with his, his pure physical prowess. He has to use his brain. He has to use his wit. He has to, you know, trick the tiger into falling into a trap or things like that. So, so yeah, I think that's where the trickster becomes an integral part of the human psyche. And even bringing back, uh, bringing that out of the hunt is a good point because the tricksters are always, or very often, uh, more than other characters, ruled by their passions. They're looking for something to eat, or they're looking for something to have sex with, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That is true too. (laughs) 
So um, there's there and they're, they're they're boundary crossers too. I like the, the like the like the social edge and the taboo breaking of the tricksters. And you know, I I was about to say that like tricksters are not always malicious, um, but that's not always true i don't know how would you describe it because i mean <laughs> i don't think anything's always true of the trickster that's part of the fun yeah yeah no you're right you're right um, but but they are like um but they are known to be like a lot of trickster stories they are both the giver of gifts maybe maybe it's fire maybe it's tools but also maybe the inventor of lies like that comes up a lot right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so shape changers yeah so there's like there's a trickster energy like uh, um our friend jersey drost uh, uh like counsels us often to like harness that trickster energy when going into certain situations and it's one of the most my favorite things that he does he's our guru he is well why don't we just uh get right into it because i think that um by way of talking about our different tricksters um the idea of the trickster will become more clear sure okay well, can I tell the Loki story real oh, quick? Oh, yeah, you had a Loki story. I just want an introductory introductory story as like the, this I, that sort of ambiguity. And I and I read um, he's the he's the guy in the Marvel movies, right? Yes, yes, he is um, played by famously played by David Hasselhoff in the Marvel movies. That's right, that's right. Um, so, but but I, this is I, I love the the Norse myth growing up, but somehow I had missed this one um, until just the last couple of years, and it's the story of uh, when the the um, they want uh, Thor and Odin and, and company want a great wall built and this giant comes to build a wall and and he agrees to build it in a certain amount of time. And there and if he does it in under the amount of time, if he overdoes his amount of time, they don't have to pay him or something like this. And there and then like Loki's like, I'll get you guys out of this. And he transforms himself into a mare. And, uh, and the reason that the wall is being built so quickly is because this giant also has this like eight legged horse that's doing the work so fast and Loki transforms himself into a mare and the stallion, the giant stallion chases Loki off into the, into the fields. I'm the mayor of Asgard. <laughs> and then the, oh, not that the, kind and, of mare. no, not that kind of mare, a lady horse. Loki transforms himself into a lady horse. Right. And uh, the, 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 the stallion impregnates Loki in lady horse form. And that is where Odin gets his his famous eight legged horse that he uh, rides around on. Is it's one of Loki's? Um, it was born of Loki when when he was a lady horse. Wow! So so sleep near. That's that's I believe yes. that's the horse's name. Yeah 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 yeah. Is Loki's son? Yeah right. Weird. From when Loki was in lady horse form, and so like that sort of like <laughs> like like weird fluidity is is part of the trickster spirit too you know and uh i just want to point out we don't get overly political but uh for everybody who thinks that the idea of gender fluidity is some new fangled thing mm, our ancient myths would beg to differ oh yeah our ancient myths we like it's it's you know people will get pregnant from uh, uh, um somebody transforming into a shower of golden coins. Right. That's right. some experimental stuff there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so let's get into the tricksters. Oh, shoot. We have to do our uh, our coin toss. We do. All right. Well, I've got... And you are the, you are the keeper of the coin. I am the so... keeper of the coin. Um, Don't my... screw it up. I am not going to screw it up. I have to go get my treasure chest, or we could use this wonderful one euro coin that i have on my desk if you don't mind i do mind i want the, mind. i want the wizard coin you want the wizard coin you knew okay. we were doing this i knew we were doing this it's the one thing i forgot i'll be right back i'm gonna get oh. the wizard coin okay um and i will edit this so it seems like he just came right back the problem is i put my wizard coin back into the treasure chest every time i use it because it's, it's so it's special you have to understand, dear listener, this is the first time that Ben's been on the monster market. And so he's <laughs> it's um, cut him some right. slack. He's he's cut, learning. I've not. Uh, yeah, I've not done this before, but I'm, I'm getting the, I'm getting the hang of it. I You're think. doing great. I think I'm doing all right. OK, here we go. Um, Renaissance Fair 1984. You can call out wizard or crown. Ready? All right. Yep. Crown. It is crown. Oh, so I get to pick. Mm -hmm. All Go right. for it. Um, well, you know what? 
I am going to take my victory and uh, I am going to go first. So my first trickster today is uh, one that I have a particular fondness for and one that there is really a lot about. Um, and that is the character of Br'er Rabbit. Uh, so part of what I like about Br'er Rabbit, he, he is absolutely a quintessential trickster character. Uh, he is he is small and and he's not that strong but he is very clever uh and he's very smart and um he just really you know and 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 everyone that he he goes up against is much larger and much more dangerous than he is Br'er Rabbit has a lot of a lot behind him that uh both story folklore wise but also culturally in America he's he's he is a uniquely American figure in that. Well, I'll 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 get into that. For those who don't know, Br'er Rabbit comes to us uh, chiefly from the American South. the The version of Br'er Rabbit that we think of has his birthplace among the African slaves in the South. I say the 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 version that we we think of, the version that we know has the origins there. But the idea of Br'er Rabbit is is sort of a an an evolution of a few different characters one of which is a character named uh Liuk who is a hare from uh Senegalese folklore so you can see where a lot of slaves that were telling the stories from from where they came from um in addition to that we also see uh very similar stories and similar character in Cherokee mythology and folklore where he's just called rabbit or brother rabbit and in fact brer is a contraction of ah, brother that's cool so brer rabbit's chief uh rivals are uh of course brer fox mm -hmm. who's always trying to eat brer rabbit um really kind of a tom and jerry situation you know, Br'er Fox is also smart and clever, but he sometimes doesn't always make the the right hmm. choices. A lot of times he will falter in his choice of weaponry or his choice of, of partner. He sounds a lot like Wiley e. Coyote. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Who's undeniably smart, right? Like he's usually like rockets and all certified this stuff. genius. Yeah. Certified genius, yes. Exactly. And and I would say you could probably draw a direct line from Br'er Fox to Wiley e. Coyote. Sure. Um oftentimes Br'er Fox teams up with Br'er Bear, who is okay. not as smart. <laughs> yeah. Um and sometimes poor bears i'm sorry i don't mean to interrupt but poor bears yeah no they yeah they have a reputation in folklore of being kind of dopey yeah because uh, they're i'm thinking of other stories where it's just the same sorry go ahead yeah um so you know those those are the chief characters but but when you get into the folklore i mean you know almost every animal is represented there is a brer wolf there okay. is um there's Sister Rabbit and Br'er Frog and Sister Possum and, you know, just just all of them. The, the whole. Oh, Sister Possum. Sister Possum. Yep. Yep. I, I will tell a Br'er Rabbit story, but I do want to talk a little bit about the cultural implications of Br'er Rabbit. Um, sure. For a lot of people, they immediately think that Br'er Rabbit is uh, an antiquated, really sort of a racist caricature. And, and a lot of that, frankly, comes from uh, one of the most famous adaptations, which is Walt Disney's Song of the South from 1940-something. I don't have it right. off the top of my head. And that is sort of a fraught discussion as well. But something, something to keep in mind is that the stories and the characters they they are they are classic they are classic stories they are classic trickster tales and they are tales as as we get further into the show you see there are tales that you actually see the same basic story being told even in other cultures with other other yeah. characters now granted i am not an expert i am not a uh, racial studies uh, professor, 
And so, you know, I'm happy to have other information pointed out to me. But one of the things as a white person, you know, I think that the Br'er Rabbit stories are are such wonderful American folklore invented and told by the African slaves. And the idea of hiding that or the idea of somehow thinking that those stories are inherently problematic, I think, is a real disservice to to the culture. Part of why we even know about the Br'er Rabbit stories is uh, a guy called Joel Chandler Harris, who in uh, 1845 began compiling these stories. These stories were uh, stories that had been told to him as a child. Uh, Harris is, was white, but these these tales were told to him and he started compiling them. And for his day, uh, Harris, wa- he was a journalist and he was considered a, for, for 1845, he was a progressive Southern journalist. And so his aim was to, to preserve them. Some might argue that that's appropriation, but others, and again, Harris's intention was to preserve these stories from, from an oral tradition because most slaves could not read or write. Yeah, I do like the I do like drawing that uh, drawing out that difference between appropriation and and preservation. Right. Even in his day, he was he was attacked kind of from all sides for doing this because mm-hmm. you had one side saying like those aren't your stories to tell, and then you had another side saying you know why are you bothering telling those stories? Right. Why are you preserving this this inferior culture? And so, like I said, even in his day, he he kind of just got it from all sides. I had mentioned that some of the Br'er Rabbit stories also come from Cherokee myth. The very first published Br'er Rabbit story was published in 1845 in the Cherokee Advocate, hmm. which was the very first Native American newspaper ever published in the native tongue. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. So 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 this is where it's like you know history is complex. <laughs> it is. And we're also we can also be very grateful to have stories certain stories at all, right? For every story I hear like this about stories being preserved and passed down. I also end up wondering, you know, what which ones haven't been properly recorded or passed down or have been forgotten. Sometimes it feels like just by luck that we have them. We've talked about this too, like even just in other mythologies, like think about all of the stories that we will never know existed, ancient stories and things like that. I do want to tell a quick Br'er Rabbit story, uh, also because this is the story that a lot of people point to as, as, well, this is the really problematic story. Okay. Really quick, another thing that I find interesting with these stories is that unlike people have pointed out that unlike European fairy tales, these stories have basically like a cast of characters and really a loose continuity. Mm -hmm. So like stories will reference other stories, you know, that came, that came before, you know, there might be a story where Br'er Rabbit is tangling with Br'er Wolf and Br'er Wolf will remember like, well, I remember when he did this to Br'er Fox and I, so I'm not going to fall for that kind of thing. So this is um, this so, this whole episode is going to be a lot of storytelling. This is so great. It is, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Brer Fox has, you know, he's he's at his wits' end, and so he decides that he knows how he's going to catch Brer Rabbit this time. So what he does is he gathers up a bunch of tar and he builds a small figure out of it, and he dresses it up in clothes, and he sets it up on a log, and he goes and he hides in a nearby bush, and he waits for Brer Rabbit to come down the lane. Br'er Rabbit comes hopping along and he sees this figure sitting on on a log and he says, howdy. And the figure doesn't say anything. So he's like, oh, maybe he didn't hear me. So he backs up and he comes by again. He says, oh, howdy. And he gets no response. Well, look, this is the South, particularly, right? Like (laughs) politeness, manners. Someone says hi to you. You say hi back. So Br'er Rabbit tells, tells him, he says, look, if I say hi to you, you say hi back to me. I'm going to give you one more chance. So he goes back and he comes and he says, you know, howdy. And the figure says nothing. 
So Brer Rabbit's like, all right, I said I'm going to give you a chance. And he just leans back. He just hauls off and he just punches the guy in the face. Well, this is what is known as the tar baby. And Brer Rabbit's fist gets stuck in the tar. And so he starts freaking out. And he starts wailing on him more. And the more he fights, the more he gets stuck. So this is the example of the trickster kind of creating their own trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, Br'er Fox comes out and he is ecstatic. His plan has worked. There is Br'er Rabbit stuck in the tar, can't do anything. So Br'er Fox takes Br'er Rabbit back to his lair. He's going to get ready to cook him finally and eat him. He tries to, trying to figure out how he's going to kill Br'er Rabbit. And, you know, is he going to skin him? Is he going to shoot him? Is he going to, you know, clonk him on the head? And Br'er Rabbit says everything that Br'er Fox says. He's like, well, maybe maybe I'll hang you. And Br'er Rabbit's like, yes, that is a great idea. Yes, hang me. And he's like, hmm, I don't have any rope. Maybe I should skin you. And Br'er Rabbit's like, oh, yes, yes, skin me. That is, that's a good idea. And Br'er Fox is starting to get a little suspicious. Like, why does he seem so <sighs> excited about me hanging him or skinning him or, you know, roasting him alive? And so finally, Br'er Rabbit says, and this is the most famous line, he says, you know, hang me, skin me, roast me, whatever. But please, whatever you do, don't throw me in the briar patch. Br'er Fox is like, huh. So you're okay with me doing all these other horrible, torturous things, but you don't want me to throw you in the briar patch. Now, this is where Br'er Fox's genius gets in the way, right? Because rather than just saying, I'm going to do the quickest, easiest, most efficient thing. Instead, he says, no, I want to cause the most pain I can on you, Br'er Rabbit. And if the one thing you don't want me to do is throw you in the briar patch, well, guess what? That's what I'm going to do. So sure enough, he takes the rabbit and he hurls him into the briar patch. And he is surprised when he hears the rabbit laughing. And the rabbit appears and says... I was born and bred in the briar patch. And he hops away and Br'er Fox is depressed <laughs> for a long time because he fell for that trick. Like I said, that is that is kind of the most famous story that most of us know. There are several other stories uh, that have similar a similar bent to that. Um, a lot of folks have pointed to the idea of a tar baby being um, a racist derogatory term for a black person, particularly a black child. Uh, what's interesting is that is actually a relatively newer slur. Hmm. Um, you see a lot of examples actually of the term tar baby being used in, in novels and, and um, newspaper articles and things like that as describing a situation that the more you wrestle with the situation, the worse it gets. Mm -hmm. But then at some point, took on this other face and that is one of the things that people uh sometimes cite as being a, a, a direct call to racism mm -hmm. in, in fact there are dictionaries and stuff that actually define a tar baby as a problematic situation that is only aggravated by additional involvement with it <laughs> right so yeah people have also pointed out that part of the popularity of this story is that this is somebody in Br'er Rabbit, who who does not have necessarily a lot of resources, has to use his wits, um, and often seeing that as an allegory for uh, even you know a slave pulling one over on on his master, or a slave managing to escape his master through his wits and cleverness. Mm -hmm. So so there's that that aspect to it as well. Br'er Rabbit is sort of a uniquely American piece of folklore partially because it does have these different origins from from Cherokee and Senegal and other places in, you know, Western Africa, um, but sort of turned into its own thing in in the United States. And the stories themselves, you know, you can you can readily find them, but they are they are really enjoyable. And, um, you know, there's nothing there. There's no humans in the stories now. The original book has the framing device of the character of Uncle Remus, which, you know, is that is that argue, a real is that from the just from the Song of the South or is that part of the Br'er Rabbit? Joel cycle? Chandler Harris's book mm -hmm. 
when he compiled all the stories, he invented the character of Uncle Remus. Really? Okay. As, That's interesting. Yeah, as sort of an amalgam of different people that he had Telling known, him the stories, okay. Telling him the stories, yeah. So that framing device is in the book. Huh, that's interesting, um, okay. That's something I never knew. And in some ways, I think a lot, a lot of people have more issue with the framing devices than they do with the actual stories. Yeah, and that, which, that, that, that scans, that's understandable. But I think it's also a case of like, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. So like old Indiana Jones in the Indiana Jones Chronicles. Right. Like that part right. doesn't, doesn't play very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's interesting. Yeah, and I also, I really like the, um, you know, as someone who's lived in Virginia for uh, quite a few years now, like I, I, I do appreciate having a, a sort of a Southern trickster character yeah yeah and what's what's fun too is that um again you know i was talking about sort of the continuity of the stories mm -hmm. um there are times where again kind of like tom and jerry uh brer rabbit and brer fox like they're mostly at odds but there are definitely times when they work together towards a common goal oh i love that or stuff. you know like they're 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 they can both be reasonable right So fans or people who follow my work, I would say, will not be surprised that I'm going to sort of lead off my parade of tricksters with Reynard the Fox. I'm a huge fan of Reynard the Fox to the point where I've um, made my uh, taken the character and made my own uh, like sort of spin off story of Reynard. Um, available now. What's that? Available now. Available now at bookstores. Uh but the but the original Reynard tales are, are medieval. They're a literary cycle uh, of sort of European, Dutch, English, French, German um, satirical animal fables. Uh, they're poking fun at society. Uh, Reynard um, particularly has sort of been associated with with French folklore, um, so much so that to the point uh, to the point that there wasn't. Uh, that they call the name for fox in French is Renard, and that has sort of circumvented the the, the old French word for uh, for fox, which was um, goupil, um, something like goupil, uh, which is related to uh, volpecula or the Italian volpe. Um, so they had the the sort of same Latin root for for fox that. Uh, sort of is in the romance languages, but Renard has taken its place to the point that all all animals are Renard, or all foxes are Renard now. Hmm. One more note about that, really quick. Um, that Volpe is we when we years ago uh, there was a movie came out while one of the times while we were in Italy and we went. It's one of the few movies that we saw in the theater there, and it was uh, uh, called La Volpe alla La Volpe, excuse me, La Volpe alla Bambina. So the fox and the child, um, and it's called the Renard in, in in the French version of it, and it is a French movie, and it was made by uh, Luc Jacquet, who uh, created March of the Penguins, and it okay. is sort of a beautiful trickstery fox story, but it's um, it's also filmed um, sort of in this in, in enormous national park, uh, so it looks very wildernessy, and it's about a little girl who sort of like slowly becomes friends with a fox and earns this fox's trust and then um it's a very gentle movie but in the end you, it, she does learn that it's it's wild it's it's not to be tamed um mm. which kind of like again slots in with the 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 tradition of what of you know especially the particularly well i think a worldwide but particularly european tradition of how they how we think about foxes uh but the renard stories are uh, sort of um sort of satirizing uh medieval society which was uh especially the sort of hierarchical non-fluid uh part of that society where there's uh it, it lampoons the you know the, the royal court and the church in turns and and they're just really they're hilarious um so reynard is is a, a consummate trickster uh, always at odds, and and the, the cycle always starts out with um, the king calling calling somebody to bring Renard in to account for his crimes. It always starts with 
with um, another famous uh, French animal character, Chanticleer the rooster. Mm. Uh, first, first called up before the king, and Chanticleer is like is going to make his case for why Renard needs to be brought to justice. He says, uh, "Renard seduced my wife." And then the doors open up, and he says, "And he also ate her." And <laughs> in 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 come uh, his the hens carting a sort of planket, and there's um, the bones of of Mrs. Chanticleer on the on the thing. Oh my! Gosh. <laughs> and they're all very. And the Renard stories are all um, horribly violent and uh, uncomfortably so in a way that you realize. Um, with changing social mores, like a lot of things that happen in the Reynard stories are are like it's it's like the difference between tom and jerry and itchy and scratchy right um and think, he, he's he's a hard the, he's a hard one to love <laughs> yeah he's a hard character to i don't want to say root for but like he is uh, yeah you would hate him except that almost everybody who's sent after him is just as bad or worse He's kind of like Eric Cartman, where like he's entertaining, <laughs> but also it's like, but he's horrible. Right. He's a horrible person. Right. Like he's not somebody that you would like want as a friend. Yeah. Or to emulate. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And um and it's also it's it's these things were like clearly a lot of these were played for laughs uh in in the medieval uh stories. And 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 we laugh maybe uncomfortably now. I suppose when you're used to like public executions and stuff, your humor has a different tenor to it than it might in the modern day. Well, indeed. And um, I guess I'd just say that um, my I have this translation of of the Renard stories uh, translated by James Simpson, and it, and it has a really good introduction. And, and in the introduction, my favorite point made in the introduction is uh, it starts out talking about Machiavelli famously counsels uh, trickery in political intrigue, right? Using your brain over your brawn. Mm -hmm. But when he talks about Renard, he says, um, these racy animal stories celebrate, celebrate survival through trickery. However, whereas Machiavelli had counseled kings to survive their enemies and subjects, Reynard is rather about how clever subjects can survive their kings. Hmm. So that to me, like that, that puts me a little bit more on the, on the side of, of the Fox anyway. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, and you know, uh, so anyway, so, so the King is always calling, uh, sending people out to get, to get Renard. And there are so many of these stories that, that I, that I want to tell and I never know which one to tell, but, um, but I'll do I'll do two very quickly, if you don't mind. One is, uh, since we've already mentioned uh, uh, poor bears, Bruin the bear is sent after Renard, and Renard is he finds Renard at the edge of the village near the carpenter's house, nosing into this um, big oak trunk that has been split and held open by a wedge, and Renard's got his head in there. And, Bruin says, you know, you've got to come to the king. You've got to account for your crimes. And Renard says, I will I'll be with you in a moment. I'm just finishing my my poor dinner. And the dare's like, what poor dinner? And he says, oh, I'm eating I'm eating poor food, the kind of stuff that you you eat when you really can't get anything else. But, it, it you know, it fills you up. And the bear's like, well, what are you what are you eating? And uh, he's like, it's honey. It's not it's not good. And the bear's like, are you kidding? You know, obviously, the bear <laughs> really wants this honey. And the fox is like, well, look, I'll wait for you. You stick your head in there, eat all the honey you want. It's fine. And, uh, of course, the bear sticks his head in and Renard kicks the, the wedge out of the tree and it closes on the bear in, in very Tom and Jerry, itchy and scratchy fashion. And then Renard raises the alarm and all the villagers come running out, including the carpenter. And the bear can't pull himself out of the tree. He's trapped there and they start beating the bear. And finally, the bear pulls himself out. But in the process, he like pulls off all the skin uh, uh, from, you know, his, his waist up. So he's just <laughs> bleeding and skinless and they're beating him. So he's he, just got fur pants. Yes, he's got fur pants and he's, they beat him as he runs to the river. And um, then he has to like scooch down the river bed on his bottom to get back to the to the king. And they're like, how could, is this thing even alive? It's just like, it's terribly violent and, and kind of wonderfully so. <laughs> Um, cartoons are so violent nowadays. Why can't they tell old fairy tales nice that don't story. have yeah, well, this and violence? That's the thing is that these, um, like everything that's 
like all these stories tend to do, they they get relegated to the nursery eventually. And so that so it happens, I think that one of the most I think one of the most famous Renard stories is um because there's always Isengrim the wolf uh sent after Renard and who also makes an appearance in your version. Yeah, who does? Yeah, yeah. Uh and he uh is sent after and, and in this version, like again, everybody's ruled by their stomach. Renard is fishing he, he's eating a tasty fish by the edge of this frozen pond and the wolf's like well where did you get that fish and he says well i'll tell you the secret to getting fish uh what you do is you you cut a hole in the ice and you you put your tail down there and the fish see your tail and they they bite it and all you do is you, you pull your tail out as soon as you fight, feel that bite uh and uh then you got a fish wolf's like well okay you know i'm gonna to try to get me a fish this way and he puts his tail down in there and renard's like you've got to wait now you got to wait a long time and he knows the fish aren't really going to bite the tail and the wolf stays there until the water freezes over and he's stuck by his tail and again like it's the same trick again he raises the alarm and the villagers come uh and and i do think that this is the one that i think in so like adaptations and stuff there's one adaptation i want to talk about where you'll see this story which was uh uh, uh an animation made for kids but it's in the the original uh medieval version is so much worse because <laughs> in the medieval version it's uh Esengrim's, uh uh wife that comes to the ice and he tricks her into putting her tail in and uh then she gets stuck and and renard's like well now that you're stuck there mm-hmm. and it, it goes it goes from there and that's when uh, that's when the wolf uh shows up and sees sees what's up and it's, it's just it's just so much worse um yeah the core of the story, getting your tail frozen in the ice, um, is is in subsequent versions, including my very favorite adaptation of Renard, which is 1937's The Story of the Fox, stop motion animation. And I think I've shared this with you before, right? Haven't I? Have I sent you this one? Have we talked about it? It doesn't sound familiar. <laughs> okay. But it, it seems like I'm sort of surprised. Prize. Okay, well, I if not, I'm going to definitely put that on on your list. You gave me Der Gollum, yeah, yeah. and I'm going to give you the story of the fox. Oh yeah, I mean Reynard to stop motion, like I'm already in. You're in. It, it, it is so. It is. It is so good. Um, it is by Ladislas Starovich, mm. Polish Russian sort of one of the early innovators of stop motion. Um, who moved to fr- the reason we have. His version of Renard is because, you know, he moved to France in at the end of the Russian Revolution. When the Ru- Russian Revolution came, he vacated and moved to France where they celebrate the Renard stories. And then he made this wonderful, uh, man, it, amazing stop motion film w- um, where it does. It even starts with the book opening up. But this it, this the, the, the ape opens the book up and the stop motion is just incredible. And, and what he's doing um, you can see that, um, you know, Rankin and Bass, you know, they, they knew about these. They knew about these. Sure. Yeah. And uh, and so there you, and there you have it. And and uh, I'll even say, like, um, there's another one of his movies, uh, The Devil's Ball, which is another. Is it anything really... like The Mummy's Ball? Uh, you know, not not dissimilar. It's made with puppets. Mm. Uh, and it, Terry Gilliam uh, considers it one of the the best animated movies of all time. So, uh, but speaking of animated movies, final vignette, and I know you know this, um, Disney's Robin Hood began life yeah. as a, an, an, an adaptation of Renard. Yeah. Um, and you can see all, you can see it in all the designs, the wolf as the sheriff, uh, Robin as the fox. And then uh, as, so the story goes at some point, they, you know, they were reading the Renard stories and they were like, yeah let's let's change this to robin hood they were having a tough time making him likable <laughs> as, yes. as the protagonist of a of a, of yes. a film yeah and i think you know as much as i i love 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 renard the fox i'm gonna say in this in this instance i'm very glad with the call that they made yes because disney's <laughs> robin hood is one of my favorite things in the world right and so that is renard the fox So this was a new one uh, for me. Uh, this one, I feel like, I feel like we're getting our animal tricksters out in the front half because this is also <laughs> an animal trickster. This one comes actually from Malaysia, 
uh, and Indonesia, like that that whole region there. So there, there's a creature that lives in the rainforest is down there called a mouse deer. It is not a mouse. <gasps> I've seen pictures of them. They are tiny. So they, and they're the cutest things maybe in, in all of creation. Oh, they are really adorable. If you look up uh, mouse deer, I think there are different types of mouse deer. And the, I think um, and but this one is kind of specifically what's called a lesser mouse deer. And it maxes out at like 18 inches in length. Hmm. Um, but it's very common. It lives in the undergrowth of the rainforest in Southeast Asia. And so they have their trickster character, which is a mouse deer named Sang Khan Chil. And Sang Khan Chil, uh, like Br'er Rabbit, like a lot of these characters, like Jerry, <laughs> is uh, courageous and clever. Uh, has to use his brain over his brawn, but he he is tiny and he is everybody's. Uh, yeah, he he's at the bottom of the food chain. I am also going to tell a story about Sang Khan Chil, and you know you'll see some similarities and things. Oh yeah. So once upon a time in the rainforest, Sang Khan Chil woke up late, and in waking up late, he was very hungry. And he was wandering the rainforest and all of his favorite foods had already been eaten that day. So he woke up mm. too late for breakfast and he's starving. He's wandering, looking for where he's going to get breakfast, worrying that he is going to starve to death. He finally comes across this big, wide, muddy river and across the river, he sees this big, beautiful tree and the tree is just dripping with his absolute favorite fruit called a bell fruit. Okay. He was like, if I if I could just get across this big muddy river to that tree, I would be able to eat for a lifetime. This is kind of like the Billy Goat's Gruff, right? You just have to cross yeah. this river to get to the to get to the good stuff. He's sitting on the edge and he's trying to figure out how he's going to cross this river when all of a sudden this leathery snout and these bulbous eyes pop up from the river. And it's Sang Boya who is a crocodile. And he starts motoring right over to Sang Khan Chil. His big jaws open up. He's ready to just swallow the little mouse deer up in one gulp. Sang Khan Chil sees him at the last minute and he hops out of the way. And he says, Sang Buya, wait, 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 wait. Uh, hold on, don't eat me. I'm here on a mission from the king. And if you eat me, the king is going to be really mad at you. And Sang Buya, who, like other characters that we've already talked about, he's not the brightest animal in the jungle. And he says, oh, well, what, what's your mission? And so Sang Khan Chil puffs his chest out and he says, the king has sent me personally to go and count all of the animals in the forest so he knows who all of his subjects are. And I've come here now because it's time for me to count the crocodiles. So... <laughs> What I need you to do is I need you to round up all your kin and bring them to the surface so that I can count them and report back to the king as to how many crocodiles there are in his kingdom. Sangbuya is kind of like, oh, I don't know. And Sang Khan Chil says, if you do this, you will be rewarded for cooperating. If you don't do it, you'll be punished. And so he says, OK. He dives back down into the river. And sure enough, all these crocodiles start bobbing up to the surface and Sang Khan Chil gets all ready and he says okay and he starts hopping on the backs of the crocodiles and as he's doing so he's singing a song and he's counting them as, mm -hmm. as he hops across well sure enough they create this sort of natural crocodile bridge across the <laughs> river and Sang Khan Chil hops to the other side and says all right thank you very much I've counted everybody Go along, go. You, you can disperse, go home. Thank you very much. You've all been very cooperative. The king thanks you. Crocodiles all disappear, except for Sang Buya. Sang Buya swims up to the shore and he says, Hey, Sang Khan Chil, you said I would get a reward. Where's my reward? And so Sang Khan Chil looks up and he grabs two of the bell fruits off of the tree. And he says, Sang Buya, thank you for helping. The king rewards you with these two ripe fruits. And Sang Buya says, I'm a crocodile. I don't eat fruits. What am I going to do with these? And Sang Khan Chil says, well, you know, those are gifts from the king. And if you reject them, the king is going to be very angry. 
So Song Buya, the crocodile, is just, he's crushed, he's bummed, and he just swims away depressed. <laughs> and Song Kan Shil turns around and he starts eating the bell fruits and he eats and eats and eats and eats and eats until he uh, passes out from bell fruit consumption. <laughs> <laughs> Utterly charming. <laughs> I love it. A plus. Well, uh, we're at our halfway point. Oh, that's right. I have a book. Do you have a book? I have a book. I, I do. I have a book. Take a look. It's in a book. The Monster Market. Oh, we should use that song. That's a great idea. Did you just make that up? Well, it's reading Rainbow. <laughs> I know. I'm just oh, teasing. All right. <laughs> okay, so my book, and this will give a hint to uh, my last monster. Okay. Uh, my last book is by Mordecai Gerstein. Yeah. Uh, and it's a picture book called I Am Hermes, Mischief Making oh. Messenger of the Gods. Nice. And it's a really wonderful uh, kids book. I say it's a picture book, but it has, uh, it, it's, it's, it's comics too. Like it's, it's, uh, it uses the oh, language yeah. of comics. Uh, you know, his, his style, it's so loose and energetic and fun. And, um, I really don't have much more to say on it other than it's it's a ton of fun to read, uh, whether you have kids or adults. The art is really fun. Uh, the stories are really fun. I like that he hits a lot of the stories about Hermes that are maybe not as well known. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, highly recommended. I am Hermes by Mordecai Gerstein. Perfect. Um so my my book, my other book then is uh, it's called Lady into Fox by David Garnett. Uh, this is a very slender 19 book from 1922 uh, illustrated with woodcuts. Uh, this this book was I never heard of it before, uh, but Anna gifted it to me, um, I think uh, a year ago, a little over a year ago. Um, and it is one it's, it's a quick read, but it is one of the weirdest books um hands down one of the weirdest books i have ever read hmm. do tell it's it's just so strange it's so uh, um a uh, young married couple a uh, newly married couple uh moved to the country they go for walks together uh, the the wife's name is sylvie or sylvia and uh they like to walk in the woods and and at one point he, he is walking ahead a bit and he turns around and she falls silent and when he turns around right where uh, his wife was standing there is a fox and he has no question in his mind that um, not that, you know, a fox wandered up and his wife, you know, fell in a hole or, you know, walked around the corner or anything like this. He's just he, he understands immediately that his wife has been turned into a fox and she's not an anthropomorphic fox. It's just a fox. And he brings her home. And at first they uh, she's got sort of a human mind. They, they're able to play cards um, they, they still eat dinner together, this, this and that. And, but, but she slowly becomes more, uh, wild and more Fox like, mm. and it just, it just gets weirder from there. And it's, I don't want to give the whole book away in case people want to pick it up, but, um, but it's just, it's an odd story and it, uh, has, uh, like this strain, this strain of, of melancholy and tragedy running through it too. Um, I'm not quite sure it's not a horror story. Hmm. But it, it certainly is. It certainly is unique. I am up. Okay, we're gonna keep on with the foxes. <laughs> I, I, I'm on a. I'm on a track. I can't get off. It's it. the fox uh, episode. Gonna, so... It's the fox. This episode, episode we're we're we talked about more. foxes and Ben Franklin. Yes, one fox and next we're talking about Robin Hood. Now, uh, the, the the fox link is just via uh, Disney's. Uh, wonderful, wonderful ad adaptation of Robin. Okay, um, <laughs> say, not, not actually that's, a fox, but that's all right. No, okay. not actually a fox. We're just that's just sort of the thread that that follows me over to to Robin Hood. Um, Robin Hood as as trickster, definitely. Yeah, because there's so much uh, different adaptations have latched onto different things about Robin Hood, but but there is a strong trickster streak running through the Rob the the, the older Robin Hood stories. Um, with being a thief and a master of disguise um i mean 
we can't forget the the, the wonderful stork costume, but that's nothing new uh, in the Robin Hood stories. Yeah, that's in the original. I mean, he doesn't dress up as a stork, but no, but he's always he's always taking on different uh, beggars disguises, and... and yeah, beggars. And there's one specifically that I really want to tell because it's so fun. So he's definitely a master of disguise. He's definitely he definitely changes uh, professions and walks. He's a border crosser. Uh, he is also an uh, an outlaw, which seems like a simple thing to say, but but really there's a difference between outlaw and criminal. Uh, Do tell, especially 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 in the sort of in sort of the medieval tradition, an outlaw is not necessarily a criminal. An outlaw is somebody who is um, not protected by the law. Hmm. So you could be a totally honest person, but if you live, you know, outside of outside of the rule of law or outside of the city or outside the city gates, all this stuff or in the wilderness, you know, you might not be able to accuse somebody of stealing your horse or murdering your father or whatever it is, right? That's an outlaw. You are not part anybody of it. out of the jurisdiction. Out of, of jurisdiction is basically the what kings. it means. Yeah. Yeah, and so, so you don't have to obey the king, but you also don't have any recourse. If right, you neither get the protection okay. nor, um, nor, nor, you know. So the wanted posters that that's for sp- certain things that he's done, but he does not get. Like, he wouldn't get the protection of a trial or anything like that. He's an outlaw, and he he dwells like the whole mythos of Sherwood Forest is the, the dwelling on the edge. The forest is um, not the king's forest, right? It's it's um. Oh, it's it's a boundary land, and so there's... and then you could have an outlaw for an in law. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, my favorite though, one of the uh, one of the Robin Hood retellings that I like best, and that really um, embraces the the trickster aspects of Robin Hood, is Howard Pyle's Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. So Howard Pyle's is sort of regarded as the the progenitor of the American illustration tradition that led golden age the golden age yeah the of golden age of, of illustration with the brandywine tradition that led to like NCY his teacher of NCY who anyway um, but he he and he illustrated this wonderful uh, collection of Robin Hood stories um, and it's just it's full of disguise and it's full of full of this kind of thing my favorite one of all though is is Robin Hood turns butcher. And in okay. this story, um, Robin Hood, you know, a lot of these stories start where they've been like Sherwood Forest is like definitely an idealized place. And there's a lot of like just hanging around drinking ale on sunny days. And a lot of Robin Hood. The trees are always green. The trees are always green. There's always dappled sunlight. Yes, it's full of dappled sunlight. It's very much like uh, Pennsylvania in the summertime because it's our pile. <laughs> Big oak trees. And uh, everybody's dressed in green. And a lot of times his adventures start when he's just like looking for something to do. Nottingham, Pennsylvania. Yes. He's looking for something to do. So he goes, he starts on the road to town and he meets a butcher bringing his, his cartload of, of meat to town to sell. And Robin Hood's like, how much, how much do you want for the cart of meat? I'll just take the cart of meat off your hands and I'm going to go sell it. And the butcher's like, he gives him price. He's like, well, here you go. So now Robin Hood's got this cartload of fresh, uh, fresh meat. And he goes to the market and he starts singing, you know, come ye lasses and eat ye dames and buy your meat from me for three penny worths of meat I'll sell for the charge of one penny. So he's he's just he's bought this meat. He's underselling himself. He's selling it at a de- deficit to get a lot of people interested. And he sings blithely and, and he says, um, now who will buy, who will buy? Four fixed prices have I. Three penny worths of meat I'll sell to a fat friar or a priest. For sixpence. So he's marking it up for them. For I want not their customs. Stout alderman, I cho- I charge three pence. For it doth not matter to me whether they buy or not. To buxom dames, I sell three penny worths of meat for one penny. For I like their custom well. But to the bonny lass that hath a liking for a good tight butcher, I charge naught but one fair kiss. For I like her custom best of all. And then there's this, this glorious illustration of... of, of 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 robin um smooching a lady uh at the at the at his his meat table (laughs) (laughs) and there it is and 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 so he gets quite a line right and it's mostly it's mostly pretty ladies and they're all lined up to buy and people are like who 
who is this super successful butcher at the market? The sheriff of Nottingham is like, who is this? I'm going to I'm going to invite find out who that was. I'm going to invite the butcher's guild uh, to a dinner at the castle. So the butcher's guild comes to a dinner at the castle and, and the sheriff gets talking to this this young butcher. Where do you get such great meats that you're getting these kinds of lines? And he says, wait, I have to, uh, often in, in my lands, I have these just enormous and well fed cattle. Um, but I'm, I'm, I want to get out of the butchering trade. And so the, he basically lures the sheriff into saying, well, I'll, you know, I want to take a look at your cattle. I'll buy, I'll buy them off of you. And he says, well, come, come to dinner in my lands. And of course his lands are the, are in Sherwood forest and they dine the, he, he arrives and there is all the, all Robin's men there. And they give the sheriff a really good meal. And, but of course, at the end of the meal, they tie the sheriff up and, and ransom him back. And, and so the sheriff's, as is in the end of a lot of these chapters, the sheriff, it ends with the sheriff saying, basically, I'll get you, Robin Hood. Shaking his Shaking fist. Shaking his fist. Ooh, that Robin Hood. He got me again. So did he not recognize any of the Robin Hood? As Hood's these stories go, events? he starts to recognize Robin. Uh, but, but in the early ones, like, uh, he doesn't know him yet. And, and also he's, you know, able to take on these disguises. He's, he's sort of the... You get the impression he's a little bit like those Sherlock Holmes stories where he can just put on a nose and people are like, well, who are you? Um, right. You put on a fake pair of glasses. Right. And... Um, and I also like, uh, like, you know, there's the archery tradition of, of him being a yeoman or bowman. And archery itself is a bit of a trick, right? Like, it's not a brute force weapon. It's something you... It's a machine. It's a, uh, an implement that you can stand at a distance and use. Right. Finally... Uh, there is some scant evidence that can link Robin Hood to Robin Goodfellow or Puck. Ah, there is. Yes, I was going to. Uh, yeah. Was and there, there is like it's not strong, but there is th- via the medieval uh, tradition of the May Day festivals in those. So now who was that? So oh, Robin I, Goodfellow and Puck is it, Puck is sort of a, a, an amalgamation of Robin Hood. Good, in Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, Puck is the uh, messenger, trickster of the mm-hmm. fairy king and queen Oberon and, and Titania, right? Yeah. But in some versions, they just call him like, in, like I have a translation. Uh, I, no, not translation, but I have a copy of, of Midsummer Night's Dream on my desk where they just call him Robin Goodfellow. So, so those names are interchangeable even in the play. So Robin Goodfellow is also a fairy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. And and he kind of grows out of the green man as well, sort of like a, mm. a fairy of the forest. And so Robin Goodfellow was sort of the lord of misrule for the day, married to the May Queen in these May Day festivals. But the other thing that sort of grew out of the May Day, May Day festivals was the these Robin Hood plays. And and so and that was like with Robin and Marion. And so like Robin Goodfellow and the May Queen and Robin and Marion are sort of intertwined ideas. And interestingly, I was also reading about the, even the character of, of Marion. And uh, I guess she was originally like a shepherdess. Uh, and other na- there are other a- aliases for her. <laughs> One of them is Clorinda, Queen of the Shepherds. Um, That's awesome. Isn't that fantastic? I just love it. Clorinda. That. Clorinda, Queen of the it's, Shepherds. Where's Clorinda? And uh, yeah. So yeah. So the outlaw with the bow and the messenger to the to the fairies uh, are are slightly intertwined concepts, and that is uh, that is Robin Hood. How much info is there on whether or not he was a real person? That is a, that is just a muddled mess. Everything you read about it, it's like, well, maybe he was this guy and this guy, and the story is intertwined. And I think it's one of those cases where the story has been told and retold and. I don't think there's any one Robin Hood. I personally, there's probably several Robin Hoods. Yeah, I think. uh, Yeah, I think there's not any one Robin Hood, and whoever Robin Hood, whatever outlaw maybe inspired some of the stories. Mm -hmm. I think uh, if you ask, like my inclination is to think that the Robin part of it probably had more to do with, you know, coming out of the May Day um, tradition. But gotcha. I don't know. There's there's definitely a tradition of the noble highwayman. When you look historically um, and you think about Prince John, who is like one of the, the greatest villains of English literature. And yet the real Prince John, like you got to feel kind of bad for him yeah. because <laughs> let's face it. 
King Richard the Lionheart was kind of a nut job that was like, no, I'm going to run to the Middle East. Yeah, he's and not just there. Leave every- he isn't there. <laughs> yeah, like he just abandoned his post yeah. and is like, I'm going to go on. The- well, Prince John in the Disney version <laughs> says it perfectly. He goes off on this crazy crusade. <laughs> But like, that's like kind of more accurate than, yeah <laughs> you know, and then Prince John is just left having to like keep this kingdom together. Yeah. Yeah. And the other, I mean, I don't want to talk about Robin Hood, you know, for the rest of the show, but it, it another, another rich vein of fun character characterization is, is just the, is how Friar Tuck fits in. Sure. Um, I yeah. love the, um, because the, there's always a lot, in a lot of these tales, especially when it's social satire, uh, it's a very similar to what Reynard does with there being like it's lampooning the it's lampooning the high church. Mm-hmm. But then there's always like the earthly friar, um, the local priest. They're OK. You know, they're all right. Yeah. Reynard shows this and Robin Hood shows this of this, you know, this idea of it's not about like, hey, if you work hard, you can be rich, too. It's more about, no, there's these rich people and these powerful people who have their thumb on everybody else. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the only way to survive is to subvert that. Trickster is still pertinent today. Oh, yes. My final one, uh, and I telegraphed this before, uh, is my favorite Greek god and yours. Mm. And that's Hermes. Wonderful. We are not alone in this. Hermes was one of the most popular, most uh, beloved gods, even to the ancient Greeks. Like, there's a reason why there are so many statues of him. And, you know, something that's interesting when you del- when you really delve into Greek mythology um, and-, and sort of like Greek culture, you know, not all gods were treated equal by the people. Like, for example... Ares, the god of war, the Greeks didn't really worship him. Like they acknowledged him, but you don't see a lot of statues or or shrines and stuff to Ares because they they were kind of ambivalent to Ares because mm. in 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 the Greek tradition, you know, Ares is the god of war, but he's he's kind of a buffoon. Mm-hmm. Also, you know, he's it's when you see him turn into Mars in the Roman culture where he becomes not only the God of war, but also kind of the God of masculinity and virility and things like that. But that's kind of absent in the Greek. But anyways, but I'm not, I'm not talking about Aries. I'm talking about Hermes. So Hermes is absolutely the, a, a trickster character. In fact, he is the Greek God of tricksters. Uh, he is also the messenger of the gods and he's the patron god of thieves and merchants and travelers and anyone who survives by their wits all the fun people all the fun people exactly exactly uh he's also not a vengeful angry uh you know the 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 greek gods all of them have tempers for sure he maybe doesn't take things as seriously as Mm -hmm. some of the other gods do you have mentioned several times about how tricksters are border crossers. Yes. And this is absolutely true with Hermes because in addition to being a messenger and all these things, he also guides mortals to the underworld. Uh, you you have the character of, of Charon, who's the boatman, but who brings the spirits, who brings the souls down to Charon? Well, that's Hermes. Hmm. Apparently the word for this is a psychopomp. <laughs> Which sounds yeah. kind of funny to us now. But yeah, a psychopomp is a figure in folklore or mythology whose job it is to guide people to the afterlife. Cool. And I've, I've run across that in, in reading about tricksters. I, I keep running across that word, too. That's cool. It's a good one. Because um, he's 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 also uh, he is actually also associated specifically as uh, with with borders. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. with sleep. And guiding and, you know, sleep, especially in the ancient world, sleep was very closely related to death. Hermes has a very specific uh, uh, look about him. He's got a bunch of artifacts that that he uses that are identifiable. Uh, so so Hermes is generally portrayed as on the younger side, uh, not not like a teenager, but he's he's only very rarely is he ever shown with like a beard 
you know, he's he's sort of meant to just look like a young, like a like a youth, like a young man. I feel like I have such a clear image of Hermes. Yeah. And he has a lot of magical accessories. So first and foremost, he has his winged helmet and his winged sandals, which were made by Hephaestus, who is the blacksmith of the gods, who also created Talus, who we talked about in our constructs episode. Mm. Uh, He's able to fly with this helmet and with these sandals. Uh, In addition, he carries a wand, which is called a caduceus. And this wand is a rod of willow that was originally used by Apollo to herd his cattle. But Hermes stole it. And when Hermes pointed the wand at two fighting snakes, the snakes suddenly became friendly and they crawled up the wand and entwined themselves and just gazed into each other's little snaky eyes. Beautiful. This is a symbol that we still use today. You see it in hospitals you see you know Mm -hmm. that wand with the two snakes entwined so that's that's a caduceus and that's hermes wand which uh was supposedly able it's like a wand of peacefulness apollo actually thought that this was pretty cool that hermes did this and so he was like you can you can keep the wand that's that's pretty cool hermes and apollo were really good friends uh in the beginning when hermes was born one of the very first things he did was to steal apollo's cattle and apollo was very upset at that but you know later you know zeus wanted they were brothers and he wanted them to be to get along and and ultimately they did and they became uh they became pretty tight uh, you know hermes and his big brother apollo <laughs> and finally hermes also wears something which I love, and I know you will too, called the Traveler's Cloak. Ah. It's just sort of vaguely described that the Traveler's Cloak can hide many tricks within. Oh. Yeah, so it's, it's just sort of I cannot of this, even handle it. I want, I, I this, it's, yes. You need the Traveler's Cloak. I need the cloak. Traveler's Cloak. This is my dream <laughs> article of clothing. <laughs> and you know, Hermes lends these artifacts out to people all the time, right? Like he gave the winged sandals to Theseus when he had to, you know. Do you have his email address? Does he really lend them out? Hermes at Olympus.net. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> so Hermes is, is the son of Zeus and a Titan named Maya. Mm. And uh, one of his first acts as a tiny baby was actually to invent the lyre. In the story, I told you about him stealing Apollo's cattle uh, to make it up to him. Hermes actually gives the lyre to Apollo, and that's part of how they become friends, because now, you know, Apollo associated with music and Apollo almost always shown with a lyre, uh, much like Hermes is almost always shown with his helmet and his caduceus and that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, this has been all about storytelling, and so I want to tell what might be my favorite Hermes story. And it's one, like I said, it's 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 one that you don't hear all that often. Okay. Wheels have been turning. I kind of want to do a comic version of this story. I think it would be a lot of fun. Oh, I'm in. I'm in for the, to, <laughs> this will be great. So during one of his uh, philandering episodes... Zeus had to turn his uh, his his mistress, whose name was Io, into a cow to hide her from Hera. So you know he 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 saw that Hera was coming. Zeus. So he, yeah. So he yeah. quickly turns Io into a cow, and so Hera comes in and she's got her arms crossed. Right, she's tapping her foot. And Zeus is like, what? No, there's no, I'm not, no, I'm not doing anything. There's just this cow here. It's, I was just watching this cow. (laughs) Well, Hera can already, already knows that he's full of crap, but she decides that she's going to call his bluff. And she looks at the cow and she says, oh, what a beautiful cow. Oh, Zeusy woosy. I'm so sorry that I ever accused you of such a thing. I love this beautiful cow so much. May, may I have it? Could this be a gift to me, this cow? Can and I just say, I, I, actually, I also really love how in the original Greek, uh, it was Zeusy Woosy. Zeusy Woosy. Yeah. yeah. And so she's like, I, I love this cow. Please, uh, 
give give this cow to me as a gift, Zeusy Woosy. I'm so sorry that I thought the worst of you. And Zeus is like, uh, sure. <laughs> Abs- absolutely, my little duckling. Uh, this This cow is yours. And so she takes the cow and Zeus is like, oh, crap. What am I going to do now? Hera takes this cow and she puts it under the watchful eye of her guardian, Argus. Now, Argus, if you don't know, is the hundred eyed Titan. Mm. So he's just this big Titan and he's covered in eyes. And she says, Argus, I need you to watch this woman. Sorry, this cow and make sure that nothing happens to the cow and that nobody comes for the cow. And Argus says, "Okay." so Zeus is sitting up in on Olympus and he's like, I don't know what to do. I need to save Io. But Argus is down, you know, part of. Part of the reason why Argus is such a good guard is that uh, having a hundred eyes, he only needs to close some of them to sleep. So he's just always, always on alert. So Zeus is like, I know. He says, Hermes, Hermes, my boy, Hermes, lad, come here and and help your old pop pop. (laughs) So Hermes, Hermes is like, yeah, sure. What's what's up, pop? What do you need? And so Zeus tells Hermes what's going on. He's like, can you think of a way to get Io away from Argus? And Hermes says, "Uh, let me see. Let me see what I can do. Hermes disguises himself as a shepherd. He goes down and he starts playing the pan flute around Argus. And Argus is so bored because he's just got to sit there and watch this stupid cow for like eternity. And so Argus sees this shepherd and he says, Oi, shepherd. Come on, come, come play us a song. I'm bored out of me skull. And I'm bored out of me hundred eyes. <laughs> and so uh, Hermes Hermes goes over to Argus and he says, oh, absolutely. And he says, uh, you know, before I start playing, you know, funny story about this, this pan flute. And Argus says, what's that? And so Hermes starts telling him this story. Hermes continues to tell this story and continues to tell the story. And that story leads into another story. And Hermes tries and succeeds in telling the longest, most boring story (laughs) that just leads into the next longest, most boring story. And he just drones on and on and on. And Argus is trying to listen but the droning and the boring voice and slowly but surely all of Argus's hundred eyes close and he drifts off to sleep. As soon as that happens, Hermes takes his wand and he touches each eye and puts Argus to sleep forever. Oh, at which point he frees Io. Side note, some sources will say that Io actually ran off to Egypt And they say, uh, basically, Io living happily ever after is that she ran off to Egypt where they worshipped her as the goddess Hathor. Ooh. So Hera discovers what happened and she is enraged and she demands, she says, Hermes needs to stand trial for the murder of Argus. And so there's a trial and every major and minor deity are summoned and they're on Mount Olympus, and they listen to the oral arguments of why, you know, Hermes should be punished for the murder of Argus. Hermes represents himself, and he is so charming in explaining that there's no crime in boring someone to death. Like, how is that murder? (laughs) He just was telling a story, and the guy fell asleep. Like, that's that's, that's not evil. That's not an act of evil. That's not murder. So when it came time for the gods and the goddesses uh, to decide Hermes' fate, what what they were told to do is they each had a small stone with their name on it. And if they believe that Hera was in the right, then they would throw their stone at Hera's feet. If they believed that Hermes was in the right, they would throw their stone at Hermes. So it came time to decide who had won the case. And Hermes ends up in a pile of rocks all the way up to his neck. Hmm. Of course, Hera is absolutely enraged that everybody 
betrayed her and was on Hermes' side. Hermes, in the middle of this pile of stones, is actually the first cairn. Yeah. So when people stack rocks, and you see this uh, in the ancient world and in ancient Greece, uh, people would build cairns so they would stack these rocks. And the idea was that Hermes was inside those rocks. Uh, borders, as, especially. Oh, this is so good. Yeah, that he's he's in those rocks along paths to guide travelers, mm -hmm. travelers who believe that Hermes is inside each of those stacks of rocks. Way markers. That's fantastic. And it's something we still do today. So fantastic. I love it. So, yeah, I, 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 I like that story a lot. I like that story. I like I like how that story like we we. Well, and we can still see it, and we still and we and and we still see uh we still see Hermes' wand, uh, yep. and we see Hermes' helmet with uh, like FTD J florists use Jay him as... Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was gonna say uh the the reason that I I've realized that the reason I have such a clear image of Hermes um Is myself. It the flash? No, no, it's the the at the in the National Gallery. Uh, when you walk in there in that beautiful atrium with the fountain, right when you walk in, right sitting atop the fountain is this statue of Hermes. And there he is uh, uh, with with the hat and the wand pointing upwards, the wings on his feet. It's, it's a great uh, it's a great statue. I love it. Uh, so, you know, I like to uh, uh, throw little curveballs in sometimes. Oh, you're not going to do it, are you? I'm not going to I'm I'm not going to do what you think. No. Um because when I started doing the reading for this one, I came across something that I thought that can't be right. And then I thought, "No, that's too good." Uh but I couldn't find very much about it on the internet aside from um uh buying a new source. My pick for my third is St. Peter. Okay. Most of my information about St. Peter as trickster comes from a very uh, academic uh, book uh, called Mythical Trickster Figures, Contours, Contexts, and Criticisms. Uh, I ordered this on Thrift Books, and, it, and I, it even came with a from the Pine Manor College Library. So that's where this used book. It made a pretty good case for the groundwork of St. Peter being viewed as a trickster. And then it talked further about some other traditions that I found really interesting. So the scriptural portrayal of, of Peter is, is a little bit tricksterish. He's at least a bit of a bumbler and at least portrayed as sometimes a liar. One of the early, one of the, the most well-known stories of, of St. Peter is, is the story of, uh, of walking on water. So we still do have this idea of, of of Jesus out in the boat with his buds and a storm comes up and they uh, are look at, they're trying to get the boat going right. And they, they look out and they're like, where is Jesus? Oh, he's, well, he's out there walking on the water. Pretty crazy. And then immediately Peter's like, well, I can do, that. you know, like, I mean, there's this sense where he's like, well, I'm going to try to do that too. You know, in the story of Jesus is like, come on out, come on out. You can do that. But, but Peter does assume it for a moment. And then he gets out there and he starts to sink and he's flailing about. He can't really do it. Jesus pulls him up. And, and a lot of these are like, uh, it's, a, it's sort of a struggle between his faith and his, his lack of it and, and what happens because of those things. But then there's the, then there's the story of, of, uh, of the Last Supper where, where he says, or in the garden, and he says, well, I, I would lay down my life for you. Um, I'm, I will never, ever deny you, Jesus. And uh, shortly after Jesus is taken uh, away in chains or captured, right? Uh, um, and now he's going to go to trial. He's going to be crucified. And, P and Jesus says, when he says, I would never betray you, Jesus says, well, no, what, when the cock crows in the morning, you will have. And, uh, and then people start asking. It's still nighttime, still, still before sunup. And they ask, like, aren't, aren't you... Aren't you one of one of Jesus's followers? No. And he's like, nope, definitely not. And then it happens. And it's also the rule of three, right? It happens again. No, not me. Not me. I um, don't know this story. So this. Oh, is... OK. OK. Well, yeah. So he's he's sitting, I think, on a bridge or he's but it's before sunrise and Jesus has been taken to trial and they're like, things have gotten real. They're going to like kill him. They're going to crucify him. Uh, now they're looking around like, well, who's with this guy? Because he's it's kind of a trial as a revolutionary a little bit there's that flavor 
And Jesus has said, and you're like, you'll betray me. And it's, no, he's never, I never would. But then when people start asking him, wait, I think I saw you with, with him. He's like, no, definitely not. As soon as he says it for the third time, he hears, hears the cock crow and he runs away weeping. And so that's, that's a gospel story. There's, it goes beyond that. There's the apocryphal acts of Peter. So this is not canonically gospel, but it's one of the books that, you know, didn't quite make it into the gospel. And, and that's where we get the tradition of Peter being crucified upside down. They're going to, when, when they, when he finally is old, when they finally are going to put him to death, uh, for being a revolutionary Christian. Uh, is that a death metal band? Apocryphal acts of Peter. Apocryphal acts of Peter. Uh, he inverts the crucifixion, right? He said like, he doesn't want to be crucified like Christ. So he, he, uh, in, in that, in art, we see that maybe less so as people reading the acts of Peter, but you do see it in art, um, Peter. So he was also crucified. I didn't know that he was also, I know nothing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, like, uh, like, so a lot of the, the, uh, the, the apostles stories of the apostles end in their martyrdom, right? Sure. Very few of them live to old age. They are all eventually hunted down or they go to other lands and cross paths with people who don't like them so much and they get killed. Um, Peter himself does uh, in the story get crucified. He's very often pictured. You'll see it on stained glass windows sometimes with an upside down cross. A lot of the times he'll be he'll be shown like crossed on a, like like a like an X-Men kind of X, but upside down. Um, and, you know, he is portrayed as a border type person he's given the keys uh to the gates and you know when you're when you die you know he, he even in in comics like in little one panel cartoons there's always comics of saint peter like the first you know he's at the gate of heaven not in or out and that's all that's all really well and good but what was interesting from this book the case that this book made was that what i really like is that there's oh and he has the double name he's simon and then he's peter so there's that too. Like he, I, there's actually a name change in the in the thing, but th that's sort of like a th that's that's baseline stuff. That's not highly trickster uh, type stuff. But what this book I found out from this book was so there's always a tension between um, sort of especially historically between like a, a official church Christianity and then like popular Christianity which folk Christianity, folk Christianity, which also is more in tune with subconscious elements and, and pagan roots and things like this. And so it's like, so it's when these, in these unofficial realms that uh, Peter in retold stories that are like sort of not canonical, that he takes on more of a, of a trickster aspect. And apparently the, the Yaqui Spanish Mexican, New Mexican folklore of the American Southwest in like Arizona regions, they have repeated stories of Jesu Cristo and San Pedro, mm. Jesu Cristo and San Pedro stories, and in the, these very much Peter is 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 a is a is a trickster, um, and they're funny too. So like my favorite the favorite one that I read in here is Jesu Cristo and San Pedro are walking along, and they pass this house and they smell some good cooking coming from the house, and it's, they're def somebody's definitely cooking a a chicken in there, and, and Jesu Cristo. Jesus Christo sends Pedro in, go get, go get a, a roast chicken for us. Okay, okay. He goes in to get a roast chicken. He's really hungry, though. So before he comes out with the roast chicken, he's like, oh, I can't help myself. He, he eats one of the legs. Uh, he gets back to Jesus Christo, and Jesus Christo is like, oh, um, this is great, but who, who, who ate one of the chicken legs? And San Pedro says, not me. He says, no. He says, you know, no, the chickens, the chickens here are all, they, they just have one leg that, in this area of the country. Oh, okay. You sure? Yeah. No, he's just one-legged chickens here. And uh, he's like, okay, they, they eat the chicken, and then they're, they're walking along. It's it's mid-afternoon. The sun's coming down, and um, it's kind of a hot afternoon, and they see a bunch of chickens kind of roosting under a tree. They're all standing on one leg, like chickens sometimes do when they sleep, or like birds sometimes do. And Pedro says, you see, you see, like, look, one-legged chickens, just as I, just as I said. And user Chris says, oh, okay, yeah. And he picks up a little rock and he throws it at one of the chickens and it, it flaps and runs away on two legs. And Pedro says, a miracle. You've worked another miracle, user Chris. And, <laughs> and, then he, and then San Pedro picks up a bigger stone and he throws it at the whole pile of chickens and they all run away. And he says, and you see, I can work miracles too. 
<laughs> and so there's just like there's a bunch of these stories and they're 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 really they're really fun. I don't know how many of these. I think I want I had a couple more, but I think I just want to leave it there. We can we can come back to uh, Pedro and Jesu Cristo stories at some time. But I do think that it sort of illustrates uh, one aspect of tricksterism that I, that I wanted to mention at the beginning. And it's um, that tricksters act as a sort of social steam valve. Mm. Um, they, they allow they allow like the, the, the tightened uh, structure of society with all its taboos and, and rituals. Um, it allows it just like poke at those right step past them. And that's, I think, what I love uh, about those few goofy uh, San Pedro and Jesu Cristo stories. All right. Well, uh, should we do the thing? Oh, yeah. Let's do the thing. Do it. Okay. Um, uh, so you had St. Peter, and you had Robin Hood, and you had Renard, Renard. the Fox. Um, oh, boy. This is tough. Which is my favorite? You know what? Honestly, I really liked that chicken story. And St. Peter is something that I know nothing about. Okay. See, I, I go into these stories assuming a lot of background knowledge. I, I need to stop doing that. Good. My, my background with Christianity and Catholicism is highly, extremely limited. So, yes, so, I've so, heard so, jokes about... So what about... you're telling me is from now, I can, from now on I can just make stuff up. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, isn't like... that what they did anyways? <laughs> <laughs> everybody's gonna be mad at me um but i'm, I'm gonna pick saint peter because i've heard i've i've heard jokes where it's like you know so and so goes to heaven and they meet yeah, yeah, saint yeah, peter yeah. and saint peter says so yeah but but i i like i i like the idea of jesus having a buddy that's all like hey see i can perform miracles too <laughs> yeah or that just a buddy who's like no now. what that wasn't me i i didn't no and then, yeah. well because that fits in with the mischief maker uh, like who's the, trying the trickster to trickster forming Jesus. his own yes. problem like why would you lie about why would you create such an unbelievable lie for such an easy right 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 you know you could have said somebody else ate the leg you could have said uh well this chicken only had one leg but no you go with well all the chickens from here only have one leg. right right <laughs> yeah what you all pick? right so what, what was your favorite uh, so I had, uh, what did I have? So I had Hermes, I had San Conchil, and I had Br'er Rabbit. Wait, which, what did you, which one did you pick from mine? You picked St. Peter. St. Peter. Okay, okay. Um, I we could, lost track of whether we were just talking about that or that's what. Okay, so uh, your, uh, okay, so San Conchil, Br'er Rabbit, and Hermes, again, really difficult. Yeah. Because I just love the Carnes in that we still make them. I love Br'er Rabbit because it feels so close to home. I loved San Conchil because I hadn't. Maybe that's my favorite in it because I'm learning something entirely new. See, that's how I. That's how I felt. And because, yeah, same thing. And because, as you were telling that story, I was just seeing it as a picture book. Mm-hmm. So, so that's my pick. San Conchil, the tiny mouse deer. Yeah. And yeah, and if you're not familiar with what a mouse deer is, definitely yeah, look, look that them up. up. They are adorable. And just bouncing along on top of the crocodiles. That's just such a charming image. All right, so that was our trickster episode of the Monster Market. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you all. Uh, as always, for Ben Hatke, I am Zach Giolongo. And for Zach Giolongo, I am always Ben Hatke. Take a look. It's in a book. The Monster Market. Monster Market. Market. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Hey, everyone. David Universe here, producer and audio engineer for Ben and Zach's Monster Market. On behalf of the team, thanks for listening. Music for this episode was created by Twinstrumental. If you'd like to see sketches of the creatures discussed on this episode, as well as other mystical goodness, please visit us at monstermarketpod.com, as well as Instagram and Facebook at monstermarketpod. For creature recommendations, or just to say hello, please email us at monstermarketpodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, beware, because they be monsters out there.